And then last week I had mentioned that uh, we needed to talk about this word grace and this word greasy that gets attached to it and how we need to disconnect those two and wanted to take you through that a little bit. Um, so forgive my, my slides, the fonts and everything else. I just threw it together and gave it to them and said, hey, will you just put these up? Yes, I know it could be more trendy or whatever, but I don't really care. Great. So um, if, you have, if you have it, just put that word grace up there. By the way, I'm Pastor Ben. I'm the co-founder of Bethesda Church, along with my beautiful wife up here, or that was up here. And this is a place of encounter. Grace, there it is. I'm just going to run through these real quick, and then I want to get on to something, something else that's tied into grace. Let's just go to the next, next, next slide. Let's see what it says. Grace. Read this out with me. Have you guys ever heard of the word taboo? You know, when you attach the word greasy to grace, unintentionally it can make it feel taboo. Like if I talk about grace too much, that all of a sudden I'm going to get in trouble and it's going to take me off into the wrong path. When really grace is the empowering force that keeps you on the right path. So taboo, what does it mean? A social or religious custom prohibiting or forbidding discussion of a particular practice or forbidding association with a particular person, place, or thing. Now again, I don't think that the ones that have attached greasy to grace meant to make this scary. It almost feels like if you talk about grace, at some point you've got to mention, oh, well, there's greasy grace. And we're going to disconnect that today and say there's nothing could be further from the truth. What's the next, next slide? Superstition. A widely held but unjustified belief in supernatural causation leading to certain consequences of an action, event, or practice based on such a belief. Again, when it comes to this word grace, this is not a superstition, although I feel like with this word greasy connected to it, unintentionally, it, again, it was for good purpose what people were trying to do. But it unintentionally made, okay, grace could be a little bit dangerous. And if I dive into grace, I could end up sinning and doing all these things that I shouldn't do. But it says this. It says in Romans 5.20, it says, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. All right, let's see what the next slide is. I, don't, I can't even remember exactly the order I put these up. This was a, okay. This is a picture that I got when I'm thinking of Greasy Grace. Yes, Lord. <laughs> and we totally need to disconnect that word greasy because nothing could be further from the truth, from the beautiful grace of God. All right, let's just see what the next one is. I don't even. And now, this is my example. What does that word say? Okay, put the next slide up. Don't say it, though. What's that? It's not a Hershey kiss with googly eyes. But just like we would never put holy and this together. Go to the next slide. These don't go together. How many agree? Do those go together? Then why would we attach grease to grace? No. <laughs> 
All right, next slide. Where am I going? Well, Ben, if we don't have greasy grace, at least we have hyper grace. It gets too hyper, gets out of control, and people do things they should never do. Okay, well, let's talk about this word hyper grace. Let's go to the next slide. Let's read this. Let's read this. We'll read. This is uh, the KJV for our KJVers out there that need to stick with the KJV. There it is. And then we're going to go over here to the Passion Translation for people that want something a little more uh, modern. Okay, let's, let's read it with me. Okay, let's go on the left first. Ready? One, two, three, read. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, let's read it. Let's read another translation. So then, the law was introduced into God's plan to bring the reality of human sinfulness out of hiding. And yet, wherever sin increased, there was more than enough of God's grace to triumph all the more. Okay. Well, Ben, what does that have to do with hypergrace? Well, let's go to the next slide and see what that word abound means. Right here. Here's, here's, I'm going to work the text this morning, that's right. Because I'm sick of grace being called greasy. And I'm sick of seeing Christians being afraid of grace when you need to dive into that. And that's what will begin to empower you to live holy, empower you to live righteous, empower you to put, it'll put you on the right track. So here's what this word abound means. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. What does it say? Let's read it together. Paul speaks of God's grace in verse 17 as super abundant, but then adds a prefix, hyper or hooper, makes making grace hooper. Blah, 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 blah. Which could be translated super abundant grace. That's uh, Greek, by the way, over there. There is an endless fountain of grace that has been opened for us in Christ. Well, Ben, that's just the commentary on that particular translation. I'm glad you asked that. Let's go to the next slide. This is from your Blue Letter Bible, which is based off of the KJV. You can grab a word, and you can begin to research that word and dive into it and see what it means. Well, here it is again. So it wasn't something that just was made up. This is actually in your Bible. There it is. There's the word. The hyper... Yeah, parisio, hyperparisio. What does it mean? To abound beyond measure, abound exceedingly, to overflow, to enjoy abundantly, much more abound exceedingly, down here, to superabound, abound much, much more exceedingly. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. See what I got going up here. So that was in Romans 5, verse 20. Now we're jumping ahead to Romans 6, chapter 6. And we're going to read, and I want you guys to read with me because here's the thing. When you begin to read Scripture and you begin to speak it out loud, what are you doing? You're actually meditating on the Word of God. You're also, your words are spirit. So you're actually declaring your words out. And what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So can we do that together? Okay. One, two, three. Oh, by the way, by the way, before we start, sorry. <laughs> Don't read the Romans 6 1, Romans 6 2. Let's just read, read the, the, the verses. We're going to keep reading, okay? Sound good? Okay, one, two, three, go. So what do we do then? 
Do we persist in sin so that God's kindness and grace will increase? What a terrible thought. Pause. Okay. Sin, to continue to sin and to do whatever you want, because you heard people say, oh, I can do whatever I want. I'm under grace. No. The doing whatever you want comes out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life, and it actually aligns more with Satanism than it does with Christianity. The main motto for Satanism is do what thou wilt. It's not go sacrifice a baby right away or whatever. It's do whatever you want. So doing whatever you want is a carnal, fleshly choice instead of walking in the Spirit, according to Romans 8. Okay? So what a terrible thought. Read with me. We have died to sin once and for all. As a dead man passes away from this life, so how could we live under sin's rule a moment longer? All right, my slide people. You guys are doing amazing. Union with Jesus, the anointed one, were immersed into union with his death. Sharing in his death by our baptism means that we were co-buried with him so that when the Father's glory raised Christ from the dead, we were also raised with him. We have been co-resurrected in the freshness of new life. Keep going. For since we are permanently grafted into him to experience a death like his, then we are permanently grafted into him to experience resurrection life like his and the new life that it imparts. We're going to keep going. Could it be any clear that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? For we were co-crucified with Krim to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. Obviously, a dead person is incapable of sinning. And if we were co-crucified with the anointed one, we know that we will also share in the fullness of his life. Keep going. And we know that since the anointed one has been raised from the dead to die no more, his resurrection life has vanquished death and the power over him is finished. Keep going. For by his sacrifice he died to sin's power once and for all, but he now lives continually for the Father's pleasure. What else? So let it be the same way with you since you are now joined with him. You must continually view yourselves as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the anointed one. Oh my goodness. Sin is a dethroned monarch, so you must no longer give it opportunity to rule over your life, controlling how you live and compelling you to obey his desires and cravings. A little faster. Okay, what does this mean? What are the impl implications? You're 100% free right now. Whether you believe it or not, you are 100% free. Jesus said, only believe. Only believe. That's, your, that's our response. If sin has been dethroned, that means, and but you have given the power of free will and free choice, that means you're choosing to dive into that instead of choosing to dive into his arms of grace. Say, I am already free. I'm already free. Maybe we need to renew our minds to the fact that we're already free instead of a fact that we're a dirty sinner. 
Maybe we need to begin to renew our minds that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Only believe. Only believe. What's the next, what, next slide? Okay. Why? Why would we call grace greasy when it's known as the throne of grace where he sits? Where he sits. It says this, so now we draw near freely and boldly to where grace is enthroned to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. You know, the world system and the religious system will tell you you have to run away and disconnect. It says this, I need to disconnect because I feel condemned and I conform to the world system. When Jesus said, no, you're connected, you might feel convicted, but now you are converted. It's the story of Zacchaeus. He's sitting up there in the tree. He sees Jesus. Let's say he's sitting up in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He sees Jesus. He's not acting in character of who he really is. Jesus looks at him and says, I want to meet with you. I want to connect with you. Come down here. The one person that the whole town despised. You're the same culture as us. You're the same race as us. But you're a tax collector working for the Romans, and you're, you're, you're robbing us and cheating your own people. Jesus says, I want to come to your house and have a meal. I want to connect with you. What does he do? He goes and has a meal with Zacchaeus. By the way, that word, when you're having a meal, and you've probably heard me share this before. If not, I want to share it again because it is such a powerful thing. The Hebrew language, there's a word called shulchan. It means table. What do you do at a table? You eat food. The root word for shulchan is shul. It means meal. That word table also means reconciliation. It also means lamb skin. You know, if you didn't have a table, you would have like a picnic on animal skin. And in the culture and context of that time, anytime you ate a meal with anyone, you were saying, I'm going to, I'm bringing forgiveness on the scene. I'm forgiving you. I'm connecting with you, and you're equal to me. Who stretched his skin out on the cross to bring reconciliation to the world, provided himself as the lamb, as the feast, and prepared a table in the presence of his enemies and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He began to reconnect us to him when we thought we were still enemies in our minds. Connection. I want to connect with you, Zacchaeus. Conviction. Zacchaeus was convicted of his true identity of who he was. He went from an extravagant taker and cheater to an extravagant giver and a man of purity after that moment with Jesus. And, and the last thing that happened is he was converted. This is the message of grace. Next slide. Again, we come boldly. Anytime you feel you do something wrong, you screw up, you know what? God's taken care of not only your past, he's taken care of your present, and he's taken care of your future. So anytime that you end up failing in this life, don't run away and try to clean yourself up. Run boldly to the throne of grace and say, Dad, I need you. I need you my mind renewed by you. I need to be going on the right track here and go into his arms. You can't clean yourself up anyways. The only thing that's going to clean you up is his grace. His grace is more than enough. It's sufficient for everything that you face. And the reason why you keep failing is because you're not tapping into his grace. Revelations 4.20 or 4.10 the 24 elders fell down, face down before 
the one seated on the throne, and they worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. And they surrendered their crowns. What's their crowns? It's their glory, their accomp- accomplishments, their ego. And they're, they're, they're surrendering their crowns. Maybe it's not like that up there. But down here, we need to surrender our ego a lot of times. And singing, worthy is our Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, power. For you created all things. And for your pleasure, they were created and exist. All things. All things. Do I get anything else up here before I take us somewhere else? Okay, I'm done there. Okay. So, I've got 10 minutes. I want to read another passage to you. And I tell, I tell you what, just seeing the Scripture with your eyes, fixing your eyes on the Scripture, and to meditate on them and begin to say, say it, not just read it, but maybe just mutter it under your breath a little bit. My father-in-law taught me this. He said the Hebrew way of meditation is um, to mutter. It means to mutter under your breath. You ever been, you see to Jerusalem, you see all the Jews at the Wailing Wall, and they're going like this, and they're moving, and they're speaking, and they're saying their declarations, their prayers. There's something powerful when you, with your own eyes, Hear it with your own ears. Speak it with your own mouth. Get your body involved. Look down at your hands and realize you've been co-crucified with Christ, that there's holes in your hands that you cannot see. And there's grace and mercy that's leaking out of those holes. And you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You shall give someone a hug that needs a hug and they might just break down crying like, man, I just needed that. Holes in your feet. Wherever the soles of your feet will go, he will give to you, even when you don't even know it. Why is that? It's because the gospel of grace is leaking out of your feet everywhere that you walk. There's territory that you're taking in the Spirit for every step that you take. This is out of Ephesians. Man, you just say the scripture. Did you guys feel something when you started saying the scripture up there? Did it get you excited? It gets you excited. It'll either get you excited or what will happen is it'll begin the battering ram of a stronghold that you have in your mind saying, man, that's too good to be true. Yes, it is too good to be true. And it has nothing to do with your works. It has everything to do with his finished works. By the way, it's been fixed. As soon as he fixed his hands, his feet to that cross. The author and finisher of our faith fixed it before the foundations of the world. We just need to preach Christ crucified and believe it more. Christ resurrected and believe it more. That the sin problem is not a sin problem. We have a not tapping into his grace problem. But God still loved us. This is Ephesians. With such great love, he is so rich in compassion and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us in the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. So when you are dead and doomed, he said, you know what? I'm already going to connect with you. I'm connecting to you. The Zacchaeus moment. Pulling you out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and saying, you know what? I am the tree of life fixed on that cross, and I'm bringing you here with me, and we're going to connect. He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him in the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ. 
I mean, there's so, so many mind-blowing things in this scripture. Throughout the coming ages, we will be the visible display of the infinite riches of his grace and kindness, which are showered upon us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Say that. By grace I have been saved. By faith. Nothing you did could ever earn this salvation. For it was the love gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast. For salvation never is never a reward for good works or human striving. I'm getting excited, so i got to walk around and read it. For human striving. For we have become his poetry, recreate, recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one, even before we were born. God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Did you know that? That word recreated, the root word for that is to marry a wife. There's this whole marriage language in Scripture. By the way, what are we called? We're called what? The church? What else are we called? The bride of Christ, right? So maybe there's, there's some things that are happening right now that God planned in advance right now for us to walk in right now and by the way, we need to get off of our rapture rugs and stop waiting for the rapture and begin to minister to this world. Stop waiting. The only waiting we should be doing is the active waiting of those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. By the way, that word waiting, one of the meanings and definitions is to entangle, to be entangled your heart with his. Maybe that's the quantum entanglement that they're talking about here that they talk about being in two places at one time. Maybe you're seated with him in heavenly places and you're here ministering to people here on earth right now. Sorry, that was a little sidetrack. So based on that scripture in Ephesians... Here's a marvelous truth. You want to hear a marvelous truth? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Say that with me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James 2.13 says, And remember that judgment is merciless for the one who judges others without mercy. So by, judging, judge, by, so by showing mercy, you take dominion over judgment. So here's a powerful prophetic declaration based off Ephesians that you can declare over any person that's not following the Lord, any person that's not a believer right now that you're praying for and that you're hoping for. Some of these are your relatives. Some of these might be your kids. I love doing declarations, so here's one for you. Even when you were dead and doomed in your many sins, he united them into the very life of Christ and saved them by his wonderful grace. I would begin declaring that over your loved ones as if it's reality right now. That even when they're off track doing those things, you know that they shouldn't do, and maybe even they know that they shouldn't do, guess what? Jesus is saying, you are united. Just begin to de declare over your loved ones, my loved one is united to the life of Christ and Christ has saved him by his wonderful grace. That way when you get together with them, you're not thinking, how can I multi-level them, multi-level market them into the kingdom? <laughs> how can I try to convince them to become a Christian. Instead, you can sit down and connect with them, have a meal with them, love them, 
and know that God cares more for them than you. And by the way, maybe moving in love instead of trying to sell them Christianity would actually pull them into the kingdom quicker. All right, two minutes left. Two minutes left. So we, f- we found out, we took a journey, we found out that grace isn't greasy. We found out that grace is hyper. We found out that grace and holiness are over here. Sin and grease are over there. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13 real quick. Matthew chapter 13. I'll give you some homework to meditate on. How many know that Jesus, he always spoke in parables and he gave these riddles and there's some of these things that are so loaded with his goodness and his grace that it's hard to almost comprehend. One of them is uh, Matthew 13, verse 33. And it says this. It says, this is the parable of the leaven, and it says another parable he spoke to them. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Say that with me. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of a meal. And that's the end of the end of the parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which is which a woman took and hid in three measures of a meal, of meal. Now I'm like, man, what if we dove into that and begin to research that more? What is going on here? That was just like a because you can just skip over and just go right to the next parable and right to the next saying and say, okay, I'm gonna try to get through this, this whole chapter. But what is going on here? The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, okay, which a woman took and hid in three measures of a meal. So I began to research this. And in the Thayer's Greek lexicon, listen to what this leaven is. I, I, I clicked on this word leaven. I want to dive into this leaven, this, this yeast, You know, there's the yeast of the world. There's also the yeast of the kingdom. And if the increase of his government, there is no end, which one's more powerful? Kingdom yeast, right? So here's here's this word yeast in the Thayer's Greek lexicon. It says this. Words which refer to the saving power of the gospel which from a small beginning, let me move my little thing here. From a small beginning, I'll start over. Words which refer to the saving power of the gospel, which from a small beginning will gradually pervade and transform the whole human race. That's a powerful statement, that word leaven. So basically, and then who's this woman? Who's this woman? May I suggest that the woman is the Proverbs 31 woman. Who's the Proverbs 31 woman? Yes, it's the virtuous, what we would say a virtuous wife, and a lot of times we read those in in weddings, or we, we honor a woman, you know, calling her the virtuous wife, and that's all true. But the greater revelation is the virtuous wife is the bride of Christ. And if you, I want to encourage you to go home and begin to read that passage of Proverbs 31 where it talks about the virtuous wife. That's you and I. That's you and I. And what we do is we are the distributors. We are, we are the, because Romans 8 talks about two-thirds of the Trinity, Jesus and the Holy Spirit being our great intercessors and interceding for us, 
And then what's the father doing? The father is just pouring out his kindness and affirmation and security upon us. And then what's our job as the virtuous bride or the virtuous wife is to be the distributors of the leaven of heaven and placing it, those seeds of intercession that Jesus prayed in every spot, every place that we go. And what happens? Oh, Ben, I don't know what happened there. I don't even know if that made a difference. No, it's making a difference. <laughs> it's making a difference. I don't know what that made a difference. Oh, well, that's making a difference. All right, we're over. Let's, let's go ahead and stand. Um, Warren, will you come, by, come back up here? There's so many scriptures. If you just dive into the, into the scripture, you're going to find the revelation of grace everywhere that you look. By the way, grace is a person. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one who brought grace and truth. He is grace. He is truth. Titus 3 Verse 4, but when the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. By the way, Hebrews 10, verse 38, I believe, it talks, the Holy Spirit's known as the Spirit of grace. He is not greasy. It's called the grace gifts. This is how much God believes in humanity and believes in you. He will load you up with gifts first. It says the gifts of God are given without repentance. He will load you up with gifts first. And then he'll begin to woo your heart and say, you know what? I'm going to put a crown in your head and allow you to grow up into it. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, it's his grace that he poured out on us, we, be, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, I want to just do a holy repentance just as a church. And I, I know that today's a day where there's going to be people that are going to receive a revelation of grace and it's going to shift everything in your life. Guaranteed. But I want to, we're going to sing the song, um, Turn Our Eyes Upon Jesus. You know, even in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus being, it says, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That word looking, if you go look it up, <laughs> used one time in Scripture. You know why? Because he's the only one you need to look on, look upon. He's the only one you need to be gazing upon. He's the one that we look at, we gaze upon, and everything changes. He's the author. He's the authority of our faith. And he's the finisher. He said it is finished of our faith. We walk, 2 Corinthians, by faith. A lot of times we think we walk by faith. You know what I think? Mr. Faith himself, right? The position in, in Song of Songs that says, who is this one? Talking about the bride, you. 
leaning on her beloved, coming out of the wilderness. This is the position of faith. Codependency is usually bad, but codependency in the kingdom looks like leaning on him. We cannot do it alone. So I want to just pray for you, and we're going to sing this song. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would go beyond any words that I could share, anything that I could say. Holy Spirit, we need you. You're the Spirit of grace. We turn our eyes and we fix our eyes on you, Jesus. And we just thank you for a big, amazing shift when it comes to the message of your glorious grace. Let's sing it together. Yeah, also, before we sing, Warren, that's a good idea. If you don't know Jesus, if you're like, man, Ben, I've known a lot of religion, but I haven't known this Jesus that you're talking about. I want to give you an opportunity to step in. You know, it says this in Scripture. It says, behold, he stands at the door and knocks. Knock, knock, knock. He wants to come in and have a meal with you. He, he wants to reconcile you to himself. All you have to do is just open the door of your heart. And if that's you and you want to open the door of your heart and just invite Jesus in to remove all the guilt, shame, condemnation of today, of yesterday, now's your moment. You can do that. Or if you just need just a radical touch from the Lord as well, why don't you just come on up here? Just take some steps of faith and come on up here.